So hi everyone, my name is Sam. I'm the social media content creator for the Autism Science Foundation. Uh, so I'm here today with Carissa Soroy, um, who is going to tell us a little bit about her project and how her work is going so far. Yeah, so um, hi, I'm Carissa, and um, my project is focusing on a specific uh, genetic type of aut autism known as Fragile X Syndrome. And um, we hope that by studying this one specific type of autism, then we can learn more and maybe apply the methods we're using uh, in our research for other um, types of autism, whether it's genetic or, you know, an, of an unknown uh, cause. And maybe we will, you know, overall, the goal will be that we can learn about autism in general um, from our study of cells in a dish. And so what we do generically is we are able to take um, blood cells from patients and then uh, turn them into brain cells that we grow in a dish. And what's really neat about this is it retains all of the genetic info within the cell. And so it's like we have human brain cells in a dish, but we didn't have to you know, go and get a brain, which obviously is very difficult to do. Um, and so now we have what are essentially fragile X syndrome neurons in a dish uh, that have the cause of it. And we have um, collected with the help of our collaborator, Craig Erickson, um, we've collected actually 17 different cell lines. Um, some of them are just from neurotypical individuals as a comparison group. And then we have two uh, sets of Fragile X patient lines. Um, they each have a unique pattern of brain activity known as EEG. And so what we're hoping to do and what we've been working on for several years now is at first we were studying how one brain cell type um, behaves in a dish um, known as excitatory neurons. And now, thanks to the Autism Science Foundation's funding, we are now investigating a different type of brain cell known as inhibitory neurons. And this is really important because um, both cell types are extremely important uh, in the brain. And we know that uh, changes in either cell type or how they interact with each other can contribute to changes. And so we want to know, do this second cell type, the inhibitory neurons, have differences in the fragile X syndrome? Do they have differences in the two groups of patients uh, with the different um, brain activities you know, in real life? And do we see those differences in a dish? Um, we also wanna know, are they similar to the differences that we see that uh, we've already been studying in the excitatory neurons? Or are there completely unique features in this other cell type? Um, and then the final thing we plan to do is mix the two together because in our brain, we have both of the cell types mixed together. And so we want to see, well, what happens if we combine the two in a dish and then record from them? Um, and so what we do is we basically have these um, plates that we put the cells on and it lets us record their electrical activity. And so now we have all of this data from our excitatory cells. We're in the process um, and have been continuing to get the data from the inhibitory cells. And then eventually we plan to mix the two and get that third set of data. Um, and so what we've been working on for the past six months is actually a lot of it, it may not be super exciting, but it had to do with just optimizing all of these conditions because up until now, I personally have actually never made inhibitory neurons. And so we needed to figure out are the same conditions that we know work for the excitatory cells going to also work for the inhibitory cells? Do we have to change how we grow them, how we put them on these plates to record from them? Um, we tried different methods of making the inhibitory cells um, from the patient cells because there's different ways you can do that to see if maybe one is better than the other. And then finally, um, we also, in the meantime, while optimizing this and making all of these cells from our 17 patients, which takes a long time, um, in the meantime, we've been trying to really use the time wisely and also work on how we do the analysis of this data. Um, 
because we record uh, basically over the course of two months. So we have eight time points over two months from multiple batches of cells. We're gonna have the just pure inhibitory cells. We're going to eventually have the data from the mixed cells. And so we need to um, op optimize the analysis one, so it's more efficient. Um, and two, we want to be able to analyze the cells, which are kind of just on a plate at the single cell level. And so we've been working with um, collaborators who specialize in computational neuroscience and engineering, very, very smart people, <laughs> um, to how can we best analyze the data? And maybe we can actually even see differences between our two different cells and identify them just by looking at our data. That's a very long summary, hopefully, but. No, thank you so much. That was <laughs> actually like very digestible and that was a really good like technical and also layman's definition summary. And that's not always easy to do, believe me, yeah. I know. <laughs> I have tried to do the same. So far in your work, have you, what has been working, what hasn't been working? Have you noticed any massive differences between these two different types of neuronal groups that you were talking about? So the excitatory and the inhibitory? Yeah, so um, what we've been able to do so far is we tested two different methods of making the inhibitory cells. Um, and so we have kind of narrowed down which one we plan to use, which is great. Um, and so um, in the meantime, though, we did we were able to get some like preliminary data using um, fragile X and con uh, control, sorry, like neurotypical cells. And then also we had a third condition in which we took neurotypical, just you know, genetically normal cells, and then we uh, took the gene that is responsible for fragile X and decreased its levels. And so what we look to see is do those two groups where either they have fragile X syndrome or this induced version of fragile X syndrome in a dish versus the neurotypical cells, do they behave differently? And do they behave similarly to those excitatory cells? And so what we can see so far in this, you know, again, smaller set of cells, while we're making our other 17 cell lines, is um, there are some similar trends, which is really exciting. Um, so for instance, it's been published uh, in the field and also, you know, we've seen this in our cells that excitatory fragile X syndrome neurons are very, they have a lot of activity, like much higher. And so when we recorded from the inhibitory cells, we see the same trend. Um, but then when we look at different types of the activity or different like specific parameters about the uh, neurons activity, we do see some differences from what we saw in the excitatory cells. So it seems like there are some, you know, just again, uh, this uh, preliminary part where, where we're optimizing our conditions, it seems like there are some common features, no matter what the cell type was. And then and there may be some features that are very unique to inhibitory versus excitatory. Um, and those are just when we recorded them, like just pure populations of each. So now like we're, um, and we're currently trying uh, to optimize the mixed culture for that way when we have all of our other cells made, we can just start doing them all together. Um, and then it's it'll be interesting to see like what that data looks like so far. Um, would you mind talking a little bit about like what you hope the impact of this type of research is going to be or what you think the impact of this type of work will be for families specifically and for people that are kind of on the ground in their day to day? Our goal for this um, system we have here in looking at, you know, not only these different cell types, but also what's really important to us and we think is that we have these two different groups of patients. So they have the same technically diagnosis, but then we already know that their um, symptoms are not exactly the same and their brain activity isn't even the same. And so we know also that um, especially for fragile X, you know, people have been, we've been trying as a field to run clinical trials and find uh, treatments that would improve the lives of these individuals. And they've not really been successful. And we think it's because there's so much variability between people, which I mean, you, you know, you and me, we are different as well. So it makes sense. But if there's variability um, in people, that could explain why you don't maybe see a response. 
And so we're hoping is, well, we now have cells in a dish from two groups of patients with different symptoms, different presentations. Um, can we see differences in them in a dish just um, at rest, I guess you can call it. And then what we really want to do is, um, can we treat uh, the cells in a dish with potential um, compounds um, and see if the cells respond differently? Um, and what's really great, because we have such a great close working relationship with our collaborator um, who got all of these patient cells from us, uh, he also has all of this, this information about the patients as well, as far as their type of symptoms. And so our goal is, you know, big picture dream over the next X number of years is we have this data from cells in a dish from sedatory, inhibitory, mixed. We treat those cells with different compounds. We know that the patient, we have the patient's data. And then is there correlations between all of these results? Do some cells respond to one drug and the other patient group of cells respond differently? And maybe there's something related to some of their symptoms that might be relevant. And so our kind of our hope is, will this be a way that we can better inform you know, future clinical studies as well? Um, because if you can get a system like this established and you are like, well, we'd love to run a trial on, you know, these compounds and you say, well, let's see how the cells in a dish react. Okay. The cells from the two groups of patients react the same or differently. And then you may want to keep that knowledge in your mind of when you're designing the trial and actual people, not just cells in a dish. Um, and as far as, you know, the applicability beyond Fragile X syndrome, you know, as I said, it's a genetic form of autism, but, you know, ideally maybe you could then apply a similar method um, of testing compounds in a dish from different subgroups of patients um, or individuals that have autism as well. Um, different, you know, maybe they have different severities or different like core symptoms and you can see, okay, well, cells from individuals with this type of um, presentation they responded to this drug better than cells from these other individuals. And so we're hoping that, you know, this won't just be a great approach for R1 um, syndrome we study, but also different types of autism syndromes and even really any other like neurodevelopmental disorders as well. So, uh, so that's kind of the big pipe dream picture. Yeah. Of, you know, it sounds amazing and hopefully it'll lead to fruition and be helpful to patients and their families though, because that, you know, that's ultimate goal is to improve, you know, people's lives. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about like, what got you into this type of research? What's your connection to this? Uh, sure. So I guess I've always been very interested in psychology, um, just based on uh, experiences I had uh, growing up. And so I had been diagnosed with several uh, you know, psychiatric, neuropsychiatric things in high school. And so that really made me actually like very interested. I'm like, well, what's going on in my brain? Like, I want to know this. And so um, I just got very interested in psychology in general. And so I decided when I went to college, I wanted to be uh, in psychology. And initially I thought I wanted to actually be more of like a psychologist in the traditional sense, like interfacing with patients. And then I realized that I think I'm more better suited to behind the scenes work. Uh, and so I got really interested in research and just researching these different, um, you know, syndromes and develop all like that are based in development. And so um, as a result, I really like focused on, you know, neuroscience. And then um, when I went to grad school, um, I worked in a lab that studied a different neurodevelopmental disorder called Angelman syndrome. Um, where we also uh, used stem cells to model that. And so basically like the first moment I heard you can make brain cells from people's like skin or blood, like my mind was blown. And I was like, okay, that like I want to do, right. I was, I was like, why is no one else freaking out? Like, how do you not think this is the coolest thing in the world? And so, I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, how, I was like, why is not everyone doing this? I don't understand. Yeah, like, why, is, why are we not screaming? Where's the fanfare? Right. <laughs> exactly. And so I was like, okay, I know I definitely want to do this. And I know I'm really, really interested in like um, things involving like neurodevelopment and various you know, ways it can maybe go atypically. And so I wanted 
I knew I was like, okay, I want to be able to study this in a dish. And so it kind of like I, again, I was in Angelin syndrome and I knew when I finished my PhD that I wanted to be able to continue to do neurodevelopmental disorder modeling in a dish with stem cells. And so I was really fortunate in that my lab here was looking for a postdoc to do such work. And uh, that's how I got more involved, you know, closer to the autism field uh, because of uh, Fragile X, which is, you know, a, is very different than the disease I was studying.